what happens if a patient forgets to pre-med, we forget to ask, and we start the appointment? Find out today on Medical History Mysteries. This is the first of a series of dental professionals being human. After all, we are human. And unfortunately, sometimes we make mistakes. So we decided to talk about different scenarios that could and have come up. And to those of you who've sent us some stories, I appreciate it because you know who you are. You might even be inspiring a medical history mystery. So today we are talking about Patient forgets to pre-med, we forget to ask, and the appointment commences. And all of a sudden, you're part of the way through the appointment. Let's say, for example, a hygiene appointment where we know that's technically invasive. And we then ask, and the patient says, I forgot. What do we do? So the guidelines that are out there for, you know, infective endocarditis prophylaxis, tell us that if the patient forgets to take the dose prior to the appointment, they can take it up to two hours after the appointment. My problem with that, Pam, has always been, if I don't have the confidence in you to take that dose before the appointment, what confidence do I have that you'll be likely to take that dose after the appointment? Considering after the appointment, it might just slip your mind. Like, okay, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm done with my dental appointment. Let me go get to the rest of my day. And now all of a sudden, you know, two hours elapses and you forget to take that dose. Um, there are a few people who have attended my lectures over time who have said, oh, I don't even believe that they could take it after the fact because, you know, by then the bacteria is already in the bloodstream. You know, how does that mean prophylaxis if you're really not preventing at all? I mean, it's already there. I, I can only say that I, I will always abide by the guidelines. And if the guidelines say you could take it up to two hours later, then so be it. But it does offer a dilemma because what if they don't have the amoxicillin? Okay, so they leave the office. You tell them, okay, you got two hours. The clock's ticking, right? They got to go to the pharmacy. Not every pharmacy can fill a prescription that quickly. You got to get the prescription filled and then you got to take the two capsules, four capsules. And then what if you miss, what if it's three hours? Does it matter? We don't have any guidance about this. All we have is you know what the guidelines say, which is again, up to two hours after. Now, sometimes that brings us to the point where we say, okay, well, we'll just keep amoxicillin in the office. And that way, if somebody forgets, we'll just give them the dose right then and there. I am not saying you cannot. I would never tell a dental professional, dentist, hygienist, what to do or how to do it because I'm not you and you know, you're the clinician, not me. I don't I don't I, I don't pretend to be intimately involved in that patient's care. You know, you are certainly. But I will say in some states, that's like saying you're willing to take on the responsibilities of a pharmacist because you are dispensing. And so you don't know the patient's complete medical history. You don't know all about their drugs. You may not have the technical knowledge to, to know, okay, what if I give this patient amoxicillin and they're taking another drug that it would interact with or would it impact a, a medical condition they are dealing with? I don't know all of those things yet. I'm willing to give them amoxicillin probably would want a pharmacist's, you know, intervention here to see if it's okay. I've had situations where that's happened, where the clinician will call the pharmacy and say, look, here's the story. They forgot to take their dose. I want to give them one. You know, if you were dispensing amoxicillin, is there anything in their medical history that would say, please don't, or don't do this, but everyone's going to handle it differently. My opinion is I wouldn't want to take on that responsibility. Again, I'm, that's me. And you can do what you want, certainly as the clinician, uh, but I would make sure that I leave, as that patient's leaving, I would leave that thought in their head that you've got two hours. Uh, if you don't take your amoxicillin in those two hours, you know, you could be putting your, your, your life in some sort of hazard. And I'd probably make them sign something that says, okay, you know, in the next two hours, I promise to take my dose of amoxicillin. Because at the end of the day, as you know, I've worked as an expert witness all these years. If it's not in the chart, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. 
So when does the clock start? Does the clock start when that probe enters the sulcus or does that clock start when they're walking out of your dental appointment? Because if you say keep them for their hour long dental appointment, you're now an hour into your two hour window and now they have 60 minutes to get that dose in. I don't know. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable saying, hey, we'll just do your whole appointment and you just get your amoxicillin later if you're not carrying it in your practice. So in your estimation, when does the clock start? And I know the smart people that wrote those guidelines might disagree with me, but my I'm going to read the guidelines the way they are written and, and say it says up to two hours after the appointment. I'm pretty sure it doesn't say up to two hours after the procedure or up to two hours after you first, you know, begin the procedure. So based on what I've read in the guidelines, I'd say you would have two hours after you leave the office. But when does the clock start ticking? You know, you get up out of the chair, you have a little small talk. Maybe, you know, you head out to your car and you're just leaving the office. Well, 15 or 20 minutes could have blown by just you getting up out of the chair and leaving. So does it start the minute the door closes behind you or has it already started the minute you get up out of the chair? We don't have any guidance on that. All we can say is what the guidelines say, which again is up to two hours after. Now, my my advice would, would be in that situation, I certainly would facilitate by maybe calling the prescription in and getting an idea from the pharmacist, whoever, whatever pharmacist they use, how soon it's going to be ready, uh, and then make sure that the patient knows when their first stop should be to go to the pharmacy to pick it up. All right. I'm getting a few takeaways here because I think our purpose here for Medical History Mysteries is to create awareness and not necessarily create a protocol for your practice. Right. So we're talking about it. It's happened. It's probably, maybe it's even happened to you. It's important for your practice to have protocols in place, or if you'd like to be able to dispense an antibiotic in your practice, make sure you have it and make sure it's up to date and make sure there's somebody that's constantly looking at that because it's happened to me where I go to give somebody a pre-med that forgot and I may have a capsule left or three capsules left and not the four. So certainly having a protocol in place is important. And we've talked about this before about calling your pharmacist and creating a relationship with your pharmacist. And I bet you, if you've done that, and you call your pharmacist looking for a Hail Mary and see if they could turn around a prescription for you on the quick. If you have a relationship with them, I would guess that you would be more likely to get that done. No question about it, Pam. And I, I want to echo what you said and, and let everyone who's listening realize that, you know, we're not lawyers. We're not giving out legal advice on these on this series. And we would never want to supersede your authority as a clinician. So we're just putting out their information and education. It's really up to you ultimately as the clinician to make your own decision because that's your job. As far as the pharmacist relationship is concerned, you and I've spoken about this, absolutely. You have to have that relationship because it's two way. You're gonna call your pharmacist for the Hail Mary. You're gonna call your pharmacist for you know, a, a prescription in need or, or just to bounce ideas off of, but you wanna make sure that that's a bi-directional relationship too, that the pharmacist feels comfortable enough to call you and say, hey, I got this script, it's, from, it's for this patient. You know, the patient told me to come in to see you. Here's what, you know, you should know about this patient. They're taking this medication. Or sometimes it's more like, hey, doc, I got this script from you for, you know, a controlled substance. It doesn't look like your handwriting. Did you write this thing? So I, I like the, the fact that we can reach out, that it is multidisciplinary at, at all times, but that we can reach out and rely on our partners to make sure we're making good decisions, ultimately for the patient's best interest. And I guess my final takeaway would be, read your medical histories. Don't forget to review your medical history. You may have patients that you've had for years and you feel really close to them. And you might be like, oh, I know Joe, I love him. I've been seeing him for years. We're all human and we all make mistakes. So treat every medical history like it's the first time you've seen it. Don't forget to update it on a regular basis. And if you need extra reminders or protocols or something to ask about antibiotic prophylaxis prior to the appointment, man, prior to the appointment is so much easier than halfway through the appointment because it doesn't look good on your practice, doesn't look good on you, and you could be causing a significant complication for your patient. So thanks for bringing this up and what a great topic for us to talk about today. Absolutely. Learn to read your medical history like a book. That's what I always say. It's not individual chapters and individual sentences. It weaves together like a novel. So you know 
everything about your patient and realize that amoxicillin and antibiotic prophylaxis is just one piece of a very complex individual. So know all about them so you can make a decision that's not siloed, but rather kind of builds together as this one person. I love that. So for Medical History Mysteries, we will see you all next week. Take care, everybody.